My kid is difficult. I don't get them. They are so alien to me. What can I do? Well, Claire Wilson will help you with that. Claire Wilson is a team strategist at Riff. She's an expert on coaching people and teams, leveraging their unique talents and, and strengths, and acknowledge individual talents and team contributions. And she also does this very well with kids. And this is why I brought her on this episode. Claire, my little sister, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Andre. It's great to be here. It is. I can't wait to talk about this because listeners know I'm a Colby freak, Colby certified consultant, and you, this is where we first met, was at a conference of Colby's, and we got, uh, we clicked, and we talk a lot about people's talents and strengths, how we can observe it, and how people can utilize them better, yet a lot of our conversation is around kids. And it is. It is. And your son has greatly benefited from this, and this is what I want to share with the listeners today. Well, it is, Andre. I, I do work with teams. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, startups, boards, nonprofits. Um, and through the years, what I've found is um, a natural progression of that work is people immediately want to know, wait a minute, can I know, what can I do? How can I take this, what I've learned, and apply it to my family because they see the difference it makes? So yes, you and I, talk. we could talk about Colby for hours and hours. Um, I'm also a former classroom teacher, so I really have a heart for kids learning and the learning process. And I'm a mom, like you said, my son Henry, he's 12 years old. I first learned his MO when he was seven. So he has had a lot of experience firsthand of a mom who's approaching him in a way really looking at what are his natural strengths and talents and how can we lean into those uh, in a way that he understands he's very capable of solving things his own way. Right. And my kids too as well know their MOs at a very young age too. And it really helped me understand how to communicate to them and understand their behaviors as well. Right. So I think with entrepreneurs, what what I hear a lot is, um, you know, they highly successful and they have the answers to how to do well at work. But then when it comes to their kids, they can't apply that same knowledge of, you know, work harder, work better, apply pressure, write a check. And what what I think is so key to understand is that the relationship that you have with your kid and and how they problem solve it isn't really something to be solved. It's really something to be understood. And what Colby can do is it helps us with a language and a framework. And it's really that missing piece to unlock how we can get along with them, encourage them and support them so that they uh, know I have a predictable way that I'm always gonna be successful. Maybe sometimes I can't do it that way, but I have this way that's not gonna fail me and um, when they can learn that, articulate that, practice that, um, they're going to be able to not only be successful for themselves in school, but also within the family. And then later, what every parent wants, when we launch them out into the world, they're going to have all of this experience and confidence in knowing how can I make a contribution in the world. Right, exactly. And the key thing that you said there, and I want the listeners to pick up here, is they said you, you're not trying to solve your kid. When you're saying solve your kid, it's almost as if you're trying to solve a problem here and how to mitigate them, manage them. But you said to understand how your kid communicates, how your kid solves problems, and everyone has a creative different way of doing it. So can you go a little more in detail um, and I use that key specifically, that word keyword specifically, in a little more detail about how you started to observe your son's uh, MO and how he did things and how you can communicate better so he can succeed at various things. He, if, correct me if I'm wrong, he was struggling at school for a while? No, he wasn't struggling at school for a while, but he, he definitely has the MO of a of the of a, a child that's not going to typically be successful in the school right that's school what program. i meant yeah so i had i will say though had i not known this about him um and there i am convinced that 
he would not be as successful. And it's not because he's not bright or doesn't try hard. It's because his whole school career, basically, we've had a lot of supports and scaffolding and understanding in place so that he is he is pretty much an expert at 12 in, um, hey, this is how I get it done best. And um, I think that's a huge gift that he has that, um, I mean, can you imagine, we learned this when we were, I mean, I was in high school when I took my Colby, but can you imagine knowing this at a young age? Um, when I run into struggles at school, um, there's just more to it than I'm dumb or I'm not good at this, right. or, I'm gonna shut down. Well, I think that the key thing too is, I think you're also implying, his MO is not meant to succeed in today's school system in North America. Is what you're also right. recalling. Like he, he he's more of a random person. He's a very hands-on person, and we're, and learns best by touching and feeling and doing versus sitting there and thinking about it. Right. So he has this um, pioneer natural advantage, which, like you said, the way he starts solving problems, it's always through um, it's always through a challenge, a sense of urgency. He's going to make it up as he go, and he also has this high, high need to demonstrate, to build, to show. So he has a hands-on way of solving problems. He doesn't really need to work in order. Um, he's not naturally organized in his approach. And um, so that's where the school system is is very different, or at least I'm in Washington State. Um, and I would say most of North America, the school system really is mm -hmm. set up for fact finder follow through kids. Give me the information, give it back to me organized. So knowing this about him really is a way to um, play to those strengths and also when you have to operate in a way that's against your grain what does he what does he have naturally that's an advantage to get it done in his way yeah so it's not about well you know you don't have to well you don't you're not orderly so you, you don't have to work in order i mean absolutely not you you and i also share that that talent um but it's about when you have to do things that work against your grain um l let's let's figure out what's how do how do we make it a game? How do we vary the approach? How do you how do you give how do you t do it your way while always focusing on the result? Because the result does matter. But if we are if we can say this is the result that we want, how they get there needs to be up to them, because that will always be their best way of getting it done. And they're going to do it efficiently and quickly, and then enjoy it more. So, exactly. like you said, something really profound there as well. Like I've. We have to define the end result for anyone, your team member, your kids, your spouse, your friends, and stay out of the how. You may be able to help them with stepping stones or milestones, but in the end, if you let them solve it how they do best, they will get it to the end. Um, I've always gotten in trouble how I did it. I got the results, but I always seem to get resistance on how I did it. And I think this is where a lot of parents will fall into that trap. I did. I Sometimes I fall into it. My MO seems to me is very natural, and this is how we should really do it. But if it's not their MO, telling them how to do it, they'll resist. It's just it's a, it's a natural instinct. So providing, and I like what you said, provide the end result and let them figure it out on their own how to do it. Well, so... For example, in school, um, he always has to do these revolving research projects. He goes to a Montessori school, so that actually is an excellent fit mm -hmm. for him. But there's still times where, you know, it, it can be a struggle. So he came home one day, and he was frustrated, um, and he basically, and he loves school. He was like, oh, I'm just I'm really frustrated. I really like this research project. And, and you know, I think as parents, what we can do is we tend we tend to go into one or two ways. We tend to go in more of the um, skills, the thinking part of the mind, the cognitive, and it's like, well, you're a smart kid, figure it out. You know, try to solve it that way. Or you could go into the affective thinking part of the mind, and you could say, well, you need to have a good attitude, or, or you know, we're paying for private school, or you know, just buckle down and do it. And those those approaches aren't necessarily bad, but what those approaches don't look at is the third part, the Colby part of the mind, which is how he's getting it done. 
So that was actually, I could have just kind of brushed it off, you know, given him a pep talk, but instead, uh, what I did is I sat down and he's very tangible. So I got out those big post-it mm -hmm. pieces of paper, grabbed some really nice pens. And this is how we problem solve a lot when he gets stuck on something. I just get materials out in front and I just pick up materials and I just start kind of sketching out and talking. So he'll talk, he's kind of just brain dumping and I'm talking. So I said, okay, what's the, tell me more about the research, you know, what, what, what's, how does it start? Well, it starts with the ideas and, oh, how do you feel about that? Well. Well, that part I really like, Mom. You know, I so he, he's kind of uh, I can see his energy's high, his excitement. He's he's in, he's excited, he's engaged. Then it's then we find the books. Well, what's that like? Do you like you know? Well, I really enjoy the reading part. Um, and then you know he's walking me through the whole thing, and finally he said, Well, the part where I'm struggling is where I have to take the notes and then put the notes into an outline. And mm -hmm. I thought, Aha that part is the structure piece that's the part where we're no longer brainstorming which is where he thrives we are no longer you know in the details which is also where he thrives but now we're at a part where he's so energized by all the possibilities of what could be done that now when we need to do a follow-through task that's let's bring order and and now we have to make decisions and we have to kind of collapse on one way that's now going mm -hmm. forward his energy was dipping um, you know, then it was, there's artistic piece, then we put the book together, then we do it all over again. So I share that story because I think what can happen with our kids is they'll share with us what's going on, but we really have an opportunity to uncover, um, anytime our kid is talking about how they're getting something done, they're talking about their creative process and the creative process is, that is our Colby, that is our striving instincts. So the story could have been, I don't like research, I don't like English, I don't like this, but instead now he understands there's a certain part where I struggle and my energy goes down. And that certain part has to do with follow through. And there are some ways that I can deal with that when it happens. Right. And the younger the kids are, I find they, not, they don't know, they haven't been trained on what to do, what not to do, or less trained than us as adults. So if you actually watch them, that's their natural abilities coming out because they don't know anything different. And a lot of times this is where I think a lot of, I, where I failed as a parent as well is just, we're doing the, you know, we mean well, but then we're trying to train them out of their natural way of doing things. And when I start watching little kids and young young kids, I watch how they just naturally work and I can start picking up where their abilities are and you can see that purity. And it's it's really cool. And then as adults, we've been trained to do things in a certain way. So we can't, sometimes we lose track of our natural abilities. And that's why I like about the Colby is we get that those four numbers, and this is how you do best. And I like to add my own little story about my youngest. She is a, co a counteracting follow through, which is a very random way of structure. We can jump multiple paths. So if we get you know, we can go from this project to that project to that project. We thrive on that. So knowing that at a very young age, I knew now she's going to have a difficult 10 years in school because you have to show all your work. You have to do all this step-by-step -step process. She gets the answer correct, but since she didn't step out the, the 2,000 steps, she doesn't get full marks. So we've talked to teachers. Why? Why are you not giving full marks? Well, we don't know if it's a guess. Fair enough. Ask her how she did it, because she'll explain what she did. And if she can explain it properly, can she get the full marks? Some teachers said, no problem, I can do that. Some teachers said, no, has to show the work. So I told my grade four girl at the time, it's your decision now. You have to show all the works to get top marks. I don't care about marks. I'm, all, all I care is about how you figure you you correct the mistakes you made on the test or the errors so you, you learn from that and you move forward so sophie you have a decision to make if you want full marks you get to show all the marks if you get the right answer you don't show all the marks you don't get full marks it's your decision now that teacher lost it on me if she's supposed to have top marks she's a smart girl I'll say yes she is but it's her decision what she wants to do in this case, as long as she's getting the right answer and she's learning from her mistakes, that's the that's the only thing that's important to us in our family. Well, and 
what you did there is such a good example of looking at the whole picture of your daughter's creative process. It is the three parts of the mind. It's the thinking piece. You mm -hmm. know, the teacher was focused on the thinking piece. She's bright. She should be able to do better. You know, the feeling piece or the motivation. You know, she should want to do it. But what you really gave her was the gift of of her how. Like, what is she actually going to do? And then leave it up to her. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we don't want to just give our kids lists of things to accomplish and do and have them, you know, execute like automatons. And then when they leave the house, they, they kind of, they don't ever have to struggle with, well, this not struggle with, they, they don't need to take ownership. Like you gave her the opportunity to take ownership. What do I prioritize? Do I care yeah. about this? Do I care about that? And then with my oldest, fact finder, fact finder follow through needs a lot of the specifics and details and needs a very structured system. She was coming back saying, I don't know what the teacher wants. She's not giving me a process. If you hear your kids say, I don't have enough information, listen to exactly what they're saying. So when she came back to me, a lot of different scenarios is not enough details was provided or there's no real plan given. So then it's like, don't go back and say, I'm a fact finder. I need more stuff. It's like, hey, teacher, I need a few more details to understand the scope of work of the project so I can finish it on time or... Do you have an idea what the plan and the structure and the order should be so I can deliver? Because, you know, the, this example was there was four submittal process. There was four submittal times for this project. And the teacher didn't give the order of the submittal. Just here's the project and here's the four dates. So I said, now go back. You just need a little more idea. Like to me, I didn't, I didn't care. I'll f um, that's random. That's a very random grid. I'll, I'll figure it me. out. You and I have that in common. Well, no, no problem. But for her, she needed to understand that the first submittal is this, the teacher's expectations. Then after that, was fine. But I'm also helping my kids to give the vocabulary of how they receive information and give information, um, information, how they're structured, um, how they assess risk and uncertainty. If they're not too sure what's going on, they're more hesitant. Um, and then how much of a tangible model conceptual thinkers they are. Um, like for my my oldest, both of them actually, they're they're accommodating implementers. So it's right in the middle of the conceptual and the hands-on demonstrator type of person. And she couldn't figure out volumes when she got to that math. So on paper, she was struggling with that. Area was no problem. But the volume, when it came to unique shapes, we had to separate, you know, you break it down into easy to calculate uh, cubes she couldn't she struggled with that so then i remember she was a six implementer so i said let's go to the shop we had blocks so i built the block and then physically showed her to remove the sections and then it clicked right we spent an hour on paper then we spent 15 minutes with the blocks then forever she understands that and that's how she sees it in her head now so it's just different ways and then you're measured at school you're an idiot because you couldn't figure that out while you're sitting here on the board you know, who's, who failed that? I know, I know the system is the system, and I'm not trying to criticize teachers here. It's just they're, they're part of the system. They were trained to train kids that way, too. What are your Absolutely. thoughts? We, we don't learn this in school. I mean, we might learn about our learning preferences, but those are just preferences. What we're talking about is something deeper. What we're talking about is the actual need to do it in a certain way. And I have a similar story with my son on, um, you know, on paper, they were doing the geometry nets, which is simple, similar. You look at, you know, two circles with a rectangle and you have to pick what shape that is. To me, I, I accommodate with implementer too. You know, I'm thinking that's a cylinder, that's a cylinder. He's looking at it going, is that a pyramid? Like he couldn't, he's putting triangles in there. And I'm thinking, how does yeah. he not see this? so simply and so I thought oh of course you know grabbed a, a paper towel roll had him cut it apart had him trace it had him um, you know kind of build it just like what you're saying mm -hmm. he struggled struggle on paper and then realizing oh it doesn't exist until he has made it and now it's again he gets it right away so um, it is those those observations about and and listening to your kids don't don't just assume that you know, if they're struggling, it's because they have a bad attitude or that, you know, and really, I think one of the trickiest things is when you're working with 
kids that are motivated and and really bright it can be so demoralizing when we just give them more of the same more of the same more of the same because we're not talking about what their intelligence is and we are not talking about their no. willingness to to show up we are talking about this missing piece of how are they going to figure it out well a lot of kids figure it out by making it and that's not really what school um, does no and a lot of times a lot some people will do it the same way every time mm -hmm. and then like for me and you we'll do it differently every time yeah <laughs> right some people don't need a lot of information i need a lot of information right you need a hell of a lot of information <laughs> andre i need all the information <laughs> Well, and that's interesting that you say that, and, and again, about observing your children and then talking in those, you know, four modes and, uh, you know, how much information do you need? How much structure? How much risk can you tolerate? What's the hands-on approach? Um, knowing where, how you operate and then how that's different with your child. For me, like you said, I need, I mean, an extreme amount of information. So when I'm dealing with my kid, he'll accommodate that for a while. But at a certain point, I'm going to lose him. He'll mm -hmm. lose over. It leads to frustration. So dialing in that piece of our own, you know, I, it's almost like your own family teamwork, right? When you need to, we're working on stuff to get it done. So me understanding, um, that's not to short circuit what I need as far as the details. But what I need to be really mindful of is um, coming to him with as bottom line as I can manage. Mm -hmm and then letting him run with it just and, because i need more to get started i um that's me and not confusing that with with so we do have those conversations and sometimes sometimes i do have to give him more than i know that he probably needs in the moment but i will say that i will say you know usually i try to give you the bottom line um this time actually i need i need you like three minutes to really focus mm -hmm. because all of this is actually important and he'll accommodate that because he understands um, that we're different and also that most of the time um, he, he's able to start whatever I need him to start without a huge ramp up right and the thing is he'll come back for more information as he needs yep. it me and you we would like it as much as all of it up front as much as possible while other people is just give me three four pieces and then when I need more I'll come back they will get the same amount of information but just over a longer period of time Exactly. It's important for us to get started for him. And I think that's another helpful way to think of this is this is how your kids this is how people, but how your kids are going to start their creative problem solving process. Um, it doesn't mean that they might not need more information later, but to get them to start, let them go with a little, let them come back yeah. and ask more and fill it in. And this is where the glaze over. I start to watch the kid when the kids glaze over yeah. or even a teammate. It could be an ad an all either action mode is when they start to glaze over. It's not that they, I, it took me a while to realize this, but they don't care. It's actually their brain kind of going too much, too much fact funny, too much. Like you start telling me, okay, now you need to go one, two, three, four, five. And you start, after you get past the third step, mm, I'm out. Like it, it, I can't, and, and then it, now my follow through is tapped out. So just give me the first two, then I'll go right so even if you keep changing plans and you know when you're starting to do risky things some kids are more they want to maintain the chaos and want to make sure that plan a b c and d is all there that the they make sure that there won't be unknown surprises watch that glaze over if you start saying hey i want to or if they go oh my god not again another change right they're not trying to be sometimes most times i don't think they're being rude it's just that's their natural instinct to reply oh here we go again Right. And or so I can't I, see that. I don't understand. I can't touch it, feel it. That means they need to be demonstrated. And I think that's where if you could start not assuming immediately that your kid just has a bad attitude, your kid might have a bad attitude, mm -hmm. but it could also be that this need isn't being met or it's being flooded out like we talked about. So, um, you know, kids that do need, you know, Henry and I don't need a lot of structure. Uh, to get started so uh, but we do have a lot of solid routines in place to kind of protect us from ourselves and so if you looked at us you would think well they're they're very organized and we are in many ways but it's the simplest <laughs> I mean it's we 
it's the simplest way to be organized that we keep going. And I think too, knowing that, um, knowing that we build in a lot of unstructured time on the weekends. So for him too, to understand, well, a lot of life is structured and that's mm -hmm. just, you just have to deal with it. So what can you do to kind of protect your energy in times that, you know, let's like for a purpose, we got to run it this way. We're on a strict routine during the week for mornings. But then on the weekend, the plan is there are no plans. Like, he thrives. Now, other kids that I coach, that would not work for them. Other kids that I coach, if they don't know, Monday is laundry day, Tuesday, mm -hmm. I take out the garbage, Wednesday, I, um, that's not how we, we structure our time together. Um, but it, if he was a more structured child, then I would need to vary my approach and give him more of that structure so that he would feel like, oh, I am making progress. I can yep. check it off. And I mean, you have a daughter like that, so you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is I think habits are not necessarily a follow through thing. Habits mm -hmm. is stuff that you don't care about becomes routine. So you don't, don't think about it anymore as well. But yes, you do have a point. Even in the fun times, my daughter needs a plan. She needs a what's the plan? What's the expected time to leave um, and whatnot? So we got to wrap this up. We can go on for hours and hours, which is I love. I love this stuff. But Claire, what are three things that you can ask the listeners to consider for their kids in something like this? Without, you know, not everyone has their kids' MOs in front of them, but what kind of things can they, they do to start observing? Uh, I would say to start observing... Um, Pay attention to where you see resistance. So um, when you're watching your child, what are those predictable areas where you see kind of that initial shutdown and you might automatically attribute it to an attitude or, um, you know, a lack of motivation. So number one, I would say don't assume that it's automatically um, a bad attitude pay attention to where there are resistances because you might find some really predictable patterns of areas that they're struggling. Um, number two, I would say start to observe areas where it's like you said earlier, when they're little and you just watch them. I mean, it's so obvious how they're getting it done, right? So um, really how pay attention to where they're seeing those successes and, you know, kind of, I would even ask some questions. I mean, you don't have to flood them out, but just, oh, what was it about this that made that fun? Or, oh, I noticed that, you know, you did well at this, or you seem to be, so just start, it's like we wanna, um, we wanna bring to attention how, when we notice that what they're doing um, kind of fits. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that, <laughs> That's two. That's two. And then um, third, I would say, pay attention to your own, um, your own sense of when you feel very frustrated that your child is not doing it your way. And start to examine how important is that really? And like we talked about earlier, I would encourage you to, at the very basic um, level, figure out what you want from your kid and figure out when you need to buy and just kind of let them experiment with how to get there. I mean, if they're more structured, you can build that out, but at the very core of it, be very clear about what you want, be very clear about when you want it, and then cut them loose, see how they do, encourage them and support them along the way. Wow, three big things. And, and, it, all, and it quite, it's simple. In the end, it actually is simple if you just sit there and observe and what I learned to do is I have to take my ego out of it. And as much as we feel like it's best for the child, it, that's a tough thing to separate that emotion. But sometimes just sitting and watching how they do it is fantastic. So just to wrap up here, Claire said, don't assume. Observe how they do things. You know, just ask them how would you do it, right? And then they'll explain it to you. And then also... I I really like this. Pay attention to when you get frustrated when it doesn't go your way. And I think that is, I never thought of it that way, but that is a hint of 
there could be a bit of a conflict there with the MO. Um, and um, I definitely see that with some, especially with the quick start part. Um, my daughters are very co-acting, counteracting, sorry, and I'm a little more experimental. And then when they start to, I get frustrated because they don't want to explore a little more. I got to remi remind myself that the path isn't completely clear in this case or the risk hasn't been mitigated. So I th that's a really great insight for the listeners on there. So thanks again, Claire. So the point, summary, learn to observe your kids through their strengths and not how you do things. Understand them and um, understand their wants and needs and you got to take yourself out of it. Uh, yes, and again, thank you. I, we could obviously talk about this for hours. Um, always a pleasure, and I, I always, I just get so excited at the, at the, thought of areas that can be just extremely frustrating inside of teams, inside of families. Um, when you, we look at it through this lens, it really we have a great opportunity to really see our kids in a new way and in a way where we can encourage them and support them and really the end goal launch them out into the world in a way where they're competent feel confident capable and able to really participate in a way that they're going to have a lot of energy and less frustration exactly and for the listeners there there is no way you can miss how passionate claire is about helping kids understand their mo and she is one hell of an expert about around kids with their MO, a bigger, better expert than me. Um, so you can find her at riff.agency or LinkedIn if you want to check her out. Um, and thank you, Claire, for this. This is very insightful for many parents, and I know a lot of listeners will start taking action to observe, not assume, and to pay attention when things are different. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Andre. My pleasure. And for you, the listener, how different are your kids from you? Start from start there first, then don't assume, observe, and then pay attention to the differences. And uh, again, thanks again for listening and learning with me. Take care. <laughs>